In this third lesson, we look at synapses and their significance, two disorders of the central nervous system, and the role of receptors. We know that synapses are microscopic gaps where two neurons meet. You'll get a synapse between a sensory neuron and an interneuron, and again, another one between the interneuron and a motor neuron. The most obvious function of the synapse is that it allows the message to pass from one neuron to the next. They're also important because they ensure that impulses only travel in one direction. Also, at synapses, there can be joining or splitting up of many neurons. Basically meaning from one interneuron, it can split up into maybe five different motor neurons or many different sensory neurons can join together into one interneuron. And it also helps in removing continual background stimuli. For example, in the morning, if you put on a hat, you'll be able to feel that hat on your head or watch on your wrist. But after a few minutes, your brain will ignore that continuous background stimulus that you're wearing a watch on your hand or that you're wearing a hat on your head. One disorder of the central nervous system that you will look at is that called Alzheimer's disease. The cause of Alzheimer's disease is the loss of neurons and synapses in the brain cortex. We find that there are clumps of protein called plaques. So around the nerve tissue, we get plaques that form and they are tangled bundles of fibers. So here, if we look at this axon and we zoom into it, a normal one should look like this, but now it gets tangled up and looks something like this. Also, we find that this shrinking of the brain tissue, the symptoms of that generally deals with the loss of memory and a lot of confusion that comes along with that. Right? We find that people uh, find it difficult to complete simple tasks. They are very, very forgetful. They become very emotional at times. They have difficulty getting the right words in language. And it becomes very difficult for these people as well as those people who live with them. Right? Sometimes you'll find someone uh, might just eat lunch and after you pack everything away, then they might just come and say, all right, come, let us have lunch now. But you tell them, we just had lunch now, like half an hour ago. And that person will have no uh, memory of that. So it can get to a very, very bad state. Then we're looking at multiple sclerosis. The cause of multiple sclerosis is when the immune system attacks the myelin sheets of neurons. Right? So this is what we call an autoimmune disease, where a person's immune system attacks their own cells. And we spoke about the myelin sheet, which covers the axon and then some of the dendrites. And this myelin sheet now is damaged due to the immune system affecting it. So a normal myelin sheet would have covered up the axon nicely. And here you're finding that now the myelin sheet is damaged. And we know that the function of the myelin sheet, it allows, if you look at the myelin, myelinated a neuron, you'll find that the impulse travels very quickly through it. One without the myelin sheet, that impulse now has difficulty in moving through it. And since neurons are responsible for most of the responses in our body and many different parts of our body, that means that the effect of multiple sclerosis can be on many different parts of the body. It can affect sensory. Uh, neurons and as a result you're going to find that things like vision can be impaired uh, sensations from different parts of your body will be less it will affect a person's speech can be affected the urinary system that they won't be able to uh, control the urine it can also affect the movement so there's many different parts of the body that can be affected as a result of multiple sclerosis 
including the brain and memory and things like that as well. That we've already mentioned receptors. We know receptors, the core function of any receptor, it's to receive stimuli and then convert these stimuli into impulses and then those are sent to the central nervous system. So the body responds to a variety of different stimuli, such as light. Light is picked up by the eyes, and within the eyes we've got receptors, which will convert that light stimulus into an impulse, and our cerebrum will interpret that as an image that we're seeing. The sound stimulus is picked up by the ears, and within the inner ear, there's a receptor which will now convert that stimulus into an impulse and send it to the cerebrum so we understand what we're hearing. The touch stimulus from the skin, also temperature, pressure, pain, those stimuli are also picked up and sent to the brain and it will interpret and respond appropriately. And certain chemical stimuli also, such as taste from the tongue and smell in the nose, will pick up these chemical stimuli, convert them to impulses, send it to the brain, and you'll understand what's happening in your surroundings and you can respond appropriately. We know that there are, there's a link between receptors, neurons, and effectors in order for them to function appropriately. Right? So here's an example of a voluntary action where maybe a person sees a glass of water or a glass of juice, and the receptor will be the, the photoreceptors, the light receptors in the eye, They'll pick up this image, convert it to an impulse, the stimulus, and this is sent on the sensory neuron to the brain in the cerebrum. A person will understand, okay, this is what I'm seeing. Yes, I'm thirsty. I require this. And then you'll send away impulses on motor neurons to the correct muscles. Uh, you'll send it to the arm, and the arm will go towards the glass, and then to the finger muscles to close and hold the glass, and then the arm to lift it towards your mouth, etc. So this is what we're talking about. You've got the receptors that will receive the stimuli in the environment and they convert it to impulses. We send these impulses via sensory neurons to the central nervous system and then we send back impulses to the effector, which is what's going to bring about the response.